Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'll be talking with Andrew Thrasher. We'll talk about some uh, different ways to think about this market participation, this idea of breadth and narrow leadership. NVIDIA earnings after the bell today, risk off feel for stocks. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in these markets using the power of technical analysis. Earlier in the day, we were recording uh, our latest episode of The Pitch, and one of my guests, Mark Newton, said, this is the sweet spot. This is the time to be using technical analysis. When in doubt, surround yourself with charts. I love that sort of way of thinking about it. I would argue it's always a good time for charts, but especially now when things are uncertain, when things are challenging, we're trying to make sense of all these different competing narratives. We have the debt ceiling, we have geopolitical issues, we have an election season coming up very quickly. All of these things, along with all the other technical criteria that we've, uh, that we've talked about, at the end of the day, focus on the trends. Price is fact, charts will tell you what's working and what's not. Make sure you have a good routine of analyzing those markets. What we like to do on this show is share a little bit of our own process of analyzing the markets, trying to break down every day's price action and trying to connect what we see today with the longer term trends that we're observing. Let's get right to it today with our market recap. As I mentioned, a bit of a risk off feel to the uh, to the tape today. Uh, and really most of that came uh, right out of the open. You saw yesterday was uh, sort of declining through the afternoon session. Uh, today opening lower and sort of pushing down in the first uh, half hour of trading. From there, risk assets never really recovered off of those that initial drop. A bit of a bounce in the uh, in the three o'clock hour, but came back down to earth into the close. That puts the S and P for the end of the day right around forty one fifteen. That's down about three quarters of a percent from yesterday's close. The Nasdaq Composite outperforming by just a bit, but just uh, also down 0.6 percent. The Dow down 0.8 percent. Mid caps, small caps all down as well. And the small cap S and P 600, the worst performing of the group, down about 1.3 percent from yesterday's close. I'm noticing the VIX with a two at the beginning of this reading, and that is something we've been talking about for quite some time, right? Market rallying on low volatility is kind of the base case for a bullish argument here. Market selling off on increasing volatility is much more of a bearish feel. That's that risk off feel I was talking about uh, in the markets, this acceleration to the downside. A lot of stocks failing to eclipse resistance levels now pulling back from resistance, causing volatility to increase. And the VIX is right at that 20 point. We'll look at a chart of the VIX here in a few moments so you can see how that relates to the trend we've seen over the course of 2023 and before that. Interest rates overall moving to the upside, the entire yield curve sort of shifting higher. Look at how high the short end of the curve has gotten, almost to 5.2%. On the, uh, on the short end. Uh, the rest of the curve uh, up as well. The 10-year yield currently around 372. 30-year 30 30 yield pushing closer to that 4% level, currently around 397. The dollar index up by about a third of a percent, so dollar stronger, bonds, stocks weaker today. In the commodity space, you can see red for gold, silver, and copper. So the basic um, uh, metals, base metals, also precious metals, all moving to the downside. The GLD down another 0.8%, silver down 1.6%. It's an interesting situation with gold and silver. These are some of the better performing charts year to date outside of like mega cap you know, communications and technology names. I mean, some pretty decent charts, but really feeling some weakness in the short term. And that's getting to gold stocks as well. Newmont, uh, miners like FCX and others all sort of rotating lower uh, this week and, and, and failing to hold support, which is a, an area of concern. Oil prices up a little bit and the energy sector, the only one finishing the day in the green. We'll get to sectors here in a few moments, but I did want to talk about Cryptocurrencies, it's all red over here when we're looking at Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the other uh, of the 10 top coins that we track on our platform in the crypto space, all in the red. Bitcoin down about 3.5%, Ether about the same from yesterday. This puts Ethereum below 1,800 
which is a level we've talked about, Bitcoin remaining below 27,000. So again, this is an area of the market which had been stronger not too long ago, but now rotating lower. Bitcoin stalling out at 30,000 and now again sort of retesting the lower end of the range we've been here just recently. Just to finish up with the market recap in terms of the, uh, the data points, then we'll look at some charts to sort of finish things off. The energy sector up another half a percent today. Yesterday, we talked with uh, my um, guest, Doug Bush, talking about uh, energy stocks and just some opportunities where there may be some, uh, some opportunities within. One of the worst performing sectors year to date, certainly. Um, and the last uh, this week, as a lot of risk assets coming off, energy actually having a decent week of it, another half a percent higher for the XLE. After that, it's consumer discretionary, but that's down a third of a percent. Down to the worst performing sectors, real estate, financials, industrials, and REITs continuing to have a tough, uh, a tough stretch here, down another uh, two plus percent today. Brief check-in on a chart of the S&P 500. So, I mean, as we're, as we're seeing it, looking at this chart every day, right? We talked about that 4,200 level. That's that green uh, horizontal line that you see here. We see this week as another retest of the February peak. So far, we failed there at the end of April to push above there with that shooting star candle we talked about that uh, that, that uh, led to some short-term uh, retracement. Again, last week, we hit 4,200. We trade above there a couple days, but keep closing lower. And now this week, we're sort of giving back those recent gains, pushing down to the lower end of this range, not too far off of the 50-day moving average. What's interesting is if we power, if we turn on a dime tomorrow and power above 4,200, I'm concerned that we have another big set of resistance levels not too far above that point. A 61.8% retracement from the October 22 low back to the January 22 high puts us right around 4,310, 4,320, which is pretty much right at the August 2022 high. So I think further resistance a little bit above current levels. But first things first, we have to get above S&P 4,200. Uh, a lot of stocks that have gotten us to this point are pulling back as well. And I'm thinking of charts like Apple and Microsoft, semiconductors, uh, a lot of these names sort of pulling back from previous resistance. This may be setting up for that next leg higher, but for now, very much a risk off feel to the tape uh, this week. Just quickly checking in on some other charts that I think tell the story here. The VIX is another one to, to talk about. Now, we spiked up to 20 uh, really at the beginning of May, right? We talked about how volatility was getting lower and lower. The VIX getting back down in the range that was more like 2021 than 2022. We had sort of a higher volatility range uh, or regime in 2022. 2021 was much more about a consistent uptrend on lower volatility. And, and really for the last six months, even though a lot of stocks don't look like the chart of the S&P or the NASDAQ, the S&P, the QQQ, arguably in a nice uptrend uh, overall from, uh, from October of last year, and the volatility sort of getting back down into that low vol range. What's happened this week is you're seeing another spike in the VIX getting up to 20. Now, what's interesting is if you look back over time, when volatility spikes, certainly if it gets above 20, it's usually more characteristic of bearish phases than bullish phases. Stocks don't just sort of gently move higher on higher higher volatility. When people panic, when they get anxious, when they get nervous, when there's FOMO, when there's fear of losing everything, when there is fear motivating investors, volatility tends to spike. And that's usually more descriptive of a bearish phase than a bullish phase. So spike in the VIX would be sort of a negative uh, sign potentially for stocks, something certainly to watch. We're going to talk uh, breadth with my guest today, uh, Andrew Thrasher. So I don't want to go too deep down uh, the rabbit hole of breadth conditions, but I will mention the Martin McClellan Oscillator. This is a chart that we've referred to very, very often, and I've, I've very uh, just simply color-coded this chart as to whether or not the McClellan Oscillator is above or below zero. And you can see from the times when the McClellan Oscillator is above zero, which is when I have the green shaded areas, we've been in a strong up move. And when it's gone below zero, it's usually been a pretty negative sign for stocks. All of a sudden, the, fur, the four worst words to ever say as an investor, this time's different, I think, right? Now, that's, that's more like eight words. But if you look at it, the, the McClellan oscillator went below zero. We've had a couple times where we've traded back above, which all of a sudden is a little different than a lot of these observations. But, uh, but overall, uh, market's been sideways to up a little bit. What's interesting is a lot of individual names have looked a lot worse than the S&P like the NASDAQ have. But for what it's worth, the McClellan Oscillator sort of hovering right around that zero level, neither bullish or bearish at this point, but I'm going to assume that it's bearish until we power above that zero level today. It's not updated for today's close just yet. I wouldn't be surprised if this sort of ticks a little bit lower as we digest all of the closing values. 
Just to finish up, of course, NVIDIA's earnings after the close, uh, pretty meaningful. This is something uh, certainly to pay attention to. Right now in the after hours, it's down about three quarters of a percent. It's probably a little too early to pass any judgment on what's happening here with NVIDIA, but that is, that is definitely a, a name to watch uh, you know, through the after hour session and uh, in, the, uh, in, in trading tomorrow. I would argue that this market overall has felt better than a lot of the individual stocks have looked because of charts like NVIDIA that are so incredibly strong. Look at the consistent uptrend above two upward sloping moving averages, the momentum strong with the RSI pretty much the whole time above 50, the relative strength goes, goes up. Any of those things that I just said, any of those conditions change, I would argue NVIDIA starts to look very different. The market as a whole probably starts to look a little bit different as well. Netflix is another one, of course, within this FANG uh, group to watch as well. 375 has been resistance. Pretty standard in this market. You have the February high. You have stocks attempting to retest those highs. A lot of names have failed to eclipse their February highs. The S&P itself is testing that peak around 4,200. Netflix is right there as well, actually up 2.5% today, while most things are, uh, are struggling a little bit. Can it get above 375? I think that's the open question uh, for this stock uh, going forward. On the other hand, you have stocks that are testing support, and I'd point out Starbucks is a good example of that. Look at the lows from March. We then made a new high for the year at the end of April, gapped lower at the beginning of May, bounced off of the 50-day, now rotating lower yet again. Does a stock like Starbucks hold the March low, hold the 50-day moving average right around that same level, around 97, 97, 50? We're very close to what's called a confluence of support. A level like that holds, and this looks like a nice pullback within a consolidation phase. It fails. All of a sudden, this chart looks very different. It starts to look charts like uh, Nike and others that have actually failed to hold support. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Andrew Thrasher of Thrasher Analytics. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. I want to bring on today's guest, Andrew Thrasher, here in a few moments. Before we do so, a couple quick announcements. First off, we welcome your questions. We really do. Our mailbag is fueled from questions from all of you. You can email us your questions at thefinalbar at stockchartstv at stockcharts.com. Sorry, we're at Final Bar SCTV on, YouTube, on uh, Twitter and on YouTube. Uh, the Stock Charts TV channel. Put a comment below the video you're watching. We'd love to hear from you. We uh, hope to answer your question live on the air on Friday's show. Upcoming schedule tomorrow on Thursday the 25th, we have John Kosar of Asbury Research. Our latest episode of The Pitch is going to be our, uh, airing tomorrow. We just finished recording that briefly uh, earlier today. Dave Landry, Mark Newton, Joe Rabel, and I talked through 15 different stock and ETF ideas. We had a great wide-ranging discussion talking about just how to approach this market, the challenge of finding opportunities in an uncertain period, all the competing narratives, why we're surrounding ourselves with charts, and what charts we're all looking at. So don't miss that episode of The Pitch coming up uh, tomorrow. Next week on Tuesday the 30th, we have Pete Carmesino. Pete's at Chicken Analytics. Always has a great perspective with him as well. I would love to bring on today's guest, Andrew Thrasher. Andrew is a portfolio manager at the Financial, Financial Enhancement Group, founder of Thrasher Analytics, coming to us from Indianapolis. Andrew, how are you? Welcome back to the show. Good to see you. Thanks for having me again. I'm glad to, uh, this is now my third time appearance. I'm glad to be able to come back and talk charts with you. Congrats on the end. Thank you so much for coming back. It was awesome to see you, albeit very briefly at the CMT Symposium. We ended up on the NYSE floor together, but I know we had a lot of, uh, a lot of people and conversations to have, but I'm glad you were there. And congrats again on your Dow Award winning uh, uh, work. You. Again, continuing to build your, um, I guess, building the body of knowledge. And thanks so much for that. I'd love to get through, through some of your charts here, particularly we've talked about the market conditions, how they're challenging. Uh, talk us through momentum to start out with. We're looking at your weekly chart of the S&P. What does this tell you about where we're at and where we've come from? Yeah, so we've seen a lot of confirmation um, regarding the October lows where we've seen, we've seen breath rust, we've seen sector rotation. We've seen a lot of the boxes get checked mm. um, that traders look for when saying, have we seen the low? Uh, one thing is I try not to get too wrapped up in the conversation, was it the low? Are we in a bear market, bull market? We don't need to label things. We just need to evaluate what type of environment are we in? Um, with that, one of the boxes that have yet to really be checked, if you were to, to say so, is the looking at momentum. And this is a weekly chart of the S&P 500. Historically, we see momentum start to get stronger. Obviously, strong momentum was what technicians believe is going to be followed by more strong momentum and prices going higher. 
And we can measure that using the, a simple 14 day or 14 week RSI in this case. And historically we see it move into a bullish range. What that means is the 14 week RSI gets above 60. And you can see on this chart, I've put some blue circles around prior times we've seen the market sell off. And traditionally when we get back above 60 has been a really good sign um, like many of the others that we look for, of uh, the market has recovered and price momentum has regained that bullish range. And this is something we haven't seen happen yet. It's been several months now since that October low, if it was the low, and we still haven't seen uh, momentum really recover. We've gotten really close, but have yet to see 60 on the uh, RSI. It's so interesting, sure, certainly with how strong we've been off the October lows, I mean, particularly the NASDAQ, the S&P, the, the high level indexes that we haven't gotten to that trigger yet. But it's a great, great illustration of where we haven't quite gotten that upside follow through. You feel like we would need to see to be super bullish at this point. Right. Your, your second chart addresses some of the breadth care, uh, concerns that I think we've been talking about on the show. Talk us through your chart looking at uh, this uh, measure of breadth. Yeah, I think this is something a lot of technicians are looking at and scratching their heads over. And it's really been the strength we're seeing in the indices, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500. But below the surface, we're starting to see a decline in breadth participation. When we have an uptrend, what we want to see is a lot of stocks participating in that trend, a lot of stocks going higher. That's what provides the fuel for the market to, to continue to advance. What's troublesome is when we start to see that decline and specifically looking at the number of stocks above their 200-day moving average. 200 days, a common way to gauge is a stock in an uptrend or downtrend. If it's trading above, it's most likely in an uptrend. So right now we, we saw a peak early on in the year after that really strong start to kick off for 2023, and they've slowly been declining. We in fact actually have less than half of the stocks in the S&P 500 trading above the 200 day. And so the argument then gets turned into, well, it's primarily the mega caps are the ones leading, and we can narrow that down really pretty much six stocks that are leading. So that's why I also want to include the S&P 100. And so really, it's not just the mega caps are the only ones showing strength. We're seeing divergences there as well. And we are we have actually less than 100, we have less than 50% of those 100 stocks. So we really are starting to see breadth break down, not just in the broad market, but also in the mega caps as well. This is something we saw, and, and I highlighted back in Q4 of 2021, and the, the question then gets asked, does this mean the market has to roll over immediately? And like we've seen with pretty much every other market decline, is the time frame can be pretty large. We saw it happen for pretty much five, almost five, six months in 2021 before we finally got that market peak in January. So this isn't necessarily a timing tool, at least in my eyes, but it gives us an idea what environment we're in. And right now we're seeing less stocks going higher, and that creates a much harder environment for the market itself to rally. That is such a really good point, uh, Andrew. I really appreciate you making that uh, less as a timing tool, but more sort of descriptive of the conditions that we've had. Because as you, with any sort of divergences, a lot of times the market can go higher and a divergence sure. kind of persists for much longer than, than you'd want. If that is, just to ask a follow-up question, I mean, if that is the situation and we're going higher on weaker momentum, we're getting this divergence, what would be the trigger in your mind? Is there a particular level? Is it a breakdown in some of these mega of the mega stocks that have been so strong? Is there a particular S&P level or something that would break through where you say, okay, now the market's following through as you might expect? Yeah, I think you can look, I think it's, it's actually both. Um, and we can kind of use the 2021 as the playbook there to where mm -hmm. you see the broad market starting to break down and start looking at what is, been, what is leading the market higher. And similar, like in 2021, it was the mega caps. It was the FANG mm -hmm. stocks. So right now it's again, that Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA uh, are the ones leading the market higher. So when you start to look, when you just have to look at basically six stocks, if they start to roll over and you start losing your leadership, the old adage is when they start, the market starts to shoot at the generals, then you start to realize, okay, we either need to see rotation, and that's possible. We could see rotation in other sectors that start to buoy the market, but also we start seeing price breakdown. If we start seeing what used mm -hmm. to be support, um, obviously the, we're in a very well-defined range on the S&P 500. We got up to 4,200, got a tiny little breakout that didn't hold, and now we're seeing us pull back from there. So resistance is still being respected in the broad market. If we start seeing support not be respected and start breaking down, then I think that's going to be a much clearer sign that, okay, the, the environment has shifted now towards more bearishness and the price could be continuing to go lower. Um, so we need to start seeing, does the 50-day moving average hold? Does prior swing lows start to hold? Um, and we're getting close to getting getting, uh, getting those, those questions answered as the market continues to decline this week. It's so interesting. We were sharing on the show yesterday, the top 10 S&P stocks are about the same weight as the bottom 400. 
Yeah. So if you think about the strength in the S&P, right, I mean, those, those names have done so well. Those names start to roll over. It can drag down the indexes just as easily as it's been dragging them higher, I feel like. Yeah. Your next chart, I'd love to spend a couple minutes on this one. So this is, I, I've not seen this sort of uh, approach before of thinking about market breadth. Can you talk us through the year-to-date performance chart we're looking at? Yeah, so this is looking at the S&P, obviously, on the top. And then we have a breakdown of a, of a kind of a different way to look at breadth. Um, the first is looking at the average year-to-date performance of the S&P 500. Looks, it's going to look very similar to like an RSP, an equal weight in the S&P, which actually just turned negative uh, year-to-date. And probably this chart, when we get today's data, might as well, since it was only up 1% yesterday. But it's looking and showing what this story tells us is at the start of the year, when the market was up about 9%, the average stock actually was much stronger than that, almost 10%. Mm. Then we saw the market decline into March, and that's where the, the wheels kind of fell off the wagon, and we just saw stocks just basically stop moving. Um, the market continued higher. It was on the leadership of those FANG stocks, but the average stock pretty much just flatlined. And again, I, I often like to look to the S&P 100 as well, and we can see we've started to see a little bit of a breakdown there. Um, they're only up about three, probably closer to 2% now uh, for the average performance of the S&P 100. And then finally, the bottom point is just looking at how many stocks in the S&P 500 are positive year to date. Regardless if they're up 100% like Microsoft or they're they're down 20% by whatever stock, uh, the average stock right now is actually negative on the year. Um, this was before wow. today's price action. So I'm sure this, we probably even see that drop further into the 40s. Um, so right now, yes, the market's doing very well, but it's again, it's a market of stocks and the market of stocks aren't doing great after that March decline. They just really haven't been able to recover. We got down only 40% of stocks were positive in March. And now, even though the market's way still pretty pretty clear above those March lows, the average stock is pretty much there right now. Um, so it, the internals just don't look great, unfortunately. Yeah, it's not it's not a great environment. I feel like every breadth chart I look at look at is a, a new and exciting way to show this lack of breadth <laughs> support for what we're seeing in the markets. Let's look outside the US here briefly just to, to finish up if we could. We're looking at the all country world index. Is there an opportunity to be spoken of outside the U.S.? Why or why not? Yes, yeah, so we came into this year really excited to finally start looking internationally. It's a conversation we haven't been able to have as a portfolio team for pretty much a decade. Anytime you try to dip your toes outside the U.S. borders, you got punished, either on a relative or absolute basis. Pretty much the only game in town really has been domestic stocks. So we started seeing the dollar come down, which was provided some of the, the kindling or the fuel needed for international markets to perform. And they really did. We can see on the bottom panel there that in November, December, January, the first part of this year, we really saw some good outperformance in the all cap world index XUS. And then it just stopped. And it's kind of when we started getting to the, the top end of that absolute range, that 93 on ACWI. And so what we're looking for, while we do think there's long-term going to be some opportunities internationally, maybe we need to be more specific on what countries we look at. But broadly, we want to see a breakout of that 93 level. And then we also always want to look at relative performance. That's great if we can start seeing international markets go higher, but we need to be paid for taking that risk when we look at it as a portfolio manager. So I want to see relative performance also being strong. Right now, it's not. We're actually seeing, starting to see lower highs in the ratio of all cap to S&P, which is not, not real encouraging. So it's a chart I continue to watch, really looking forward to when we can start again talking about international markets in a broad sense. Right now, we really have to be a little bit more surgical with which countries specifically we want to gain exposure to, but broadly, still looking for that breakout on both the absolute and relative basis. It's really helpful. I know a lot of people sort of go on autopilot with XUS sort of thinking, right? Like have some percentage on global stocks, but you just mm -hmm. haven't gotten paid from it. It's been it's been hurting right. your performance more than anything. Why not own things where the relative strength is going up? Would be my answer, which I think you made that made that point very well. So with which is the time we have left. So if this sort yep. of situation with the anemic breath, with the challenging environment, how are you positioned in this sort of environment? Or what do you do when we're in this uncertain time? Do you stick with some of those leadership areas? Like, uh, I mean, semiconductors, of course, have been a stronger area. Um, you know, other technology mega cap names. Or is it time to get more defensive and go in places like Staples and others? They're struggling as well. Where, where do you find opportunities in this tape? Yeah, so we do a lot of our modeling is very systematic. So we run a mm -hmm. systematic um, for sector rotation. So coming into May, it was more that the sectors you you would kind of, looking back, kind of expect, communications, tech, 
uh, some places like that. Look, speaking to semiconductors, one place that we do look at for semiconductors is looking at Taiwan. And that was mm. giving us kind of a, a heads up that maybe the, the strength in semis, which also then lead to tech, wasn't as durable as some may believe. Taiwan really hadn't been performing really well, as we, at least as, as what you'd expect to how semis and tech were performing. And now we started seeing some of that, some of that weakness in tech um, in semiconductors. Uh, they got pulled up a little bit. Again, like you start out the show talking about NVIDIA, that's going to be a big bellwether uh, for that space. Um, but looking to answer your question, um, systematically, the, the market we do believe is in an uptrend. Um, it, it's hard to argue that when we, we've seen we're kind of above some key moving averages and and we are we still believe in the long term it's in an uptrend, but that could be threatened uh, in, in pretty just the next couple of weeks or two. Um, so we do have exposure to equities there. Um, when we are being more surgical in our allocations, we are looking and, and trying to and actually trimming up some of our exposures there hmm. uh, with some of our individual stocks, some of our ETFs, holding a little bit probably more cash than we were earlier on in the year. Um, I, and just kind of been seeing our hands. We haven't done a lot of, of, of adjusting long or short. Um, been talking to our advisors and just saying, hey, here's the range that we're in. And mm -hmm. like you talked about with Mark saying this kind of sweet spot for technicals where I can show them the chart and they very much can understand that not even being technicians, thinking we're in this range. I'm probably not going to be doing a lot of trading till this range is broken, either to the upside or the down. We don't want to get our hands chopped up trying to play uh, short term trading that range. That's not what our clients uh, are, are seeking from us. Um, from our, we're much more longer term focused. So we're kind of waiting for this range to, to figure itself out. Mm. The internals suggest that it's probably going to be to the downside, but until price confirms that, we're not trying to guess and predict that. Uh, internals don't look great, but we're really kind of waiting for this range to resolve itself before we really get overly bullish or start uh, getting our 2022 playbook back out and turning bearish. Feels like we still have to wait here a little bit longer. Andrew, pleasure to talk to you. Thanks again for coming on the show. Congrats again on the Dow Award. That was uh, well-deserved, and uh, we'll talk Thank to you, you again soon, all right? That's Andrew Thrasher. Andrew is a portfolio manager at the Portfolio Enhancement Group coming to us from Indianapolis. And again, congrats on winning the Charles Dow Award for excellent work building out the technical analysis toolkit. Well-deserved and congrats. We need to wrap the show, folks. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes to tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. You know, I was mentioned our episode of The Pitch that's airing tomorrow. I would encourage you to check it out. It was like a mini masterclass on how to navigate a market in uncertain times, how to leverage charting and technical analysis to help make sense of these markets. One of the charts that came out of it as I was sort of reviewing my notes and thinking about what points we were discussing as a group, it was thinking about the overall structure in the S&P. And again, there's no denying the strength that we've seen year to date in the major averages, particularly in certain areas of the market like technology. The question is the sustainability above current levels. 4,300 to 4,325 gets us to the August peak. That's also a 61.8% retracement back up to the January 2022 highs. Is there enough upside momentum to get us above that point? I think that's a huge ask of this market. You would have to see much better uh, breadth improvement, as my guest today, Andrew Thrasher, I think very well described. Chart number two is looking at Starbucks. I'm looking at a lot of names like this in the consumer space and other sectors as well. They've started to break down, right? Coming off of new highs for the year, but breaking support. In the case of Starbucks, breaking below the 50-day moving average, breaking below a trend line with the uh, lows from the last 12 months, now testing the real support level. If this holds at the March low, if it holds the 200-day, things are not getting too bad. If it pulls a Nike and starts blowing even further to the downside, this market can look a lot worse a lot more quickly. Finally, I talked about Nike as an example. This is the danger on the downside of some of the consumer space, breaking below support, breaking below the 200-day. Crocs is another name like that, sort of in that similar bucket. I am watching these to see how many names are failing to hold support. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. All of our previous interviews can be found at StockChartsTV.com. I want to thank today's guest, Andrew Thrasher of the Financial Enhancement Group and Thrasher Analytics, joining us from Indianapolis. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.